Next, from Springfield, Senate President John Cullerton speaks at Employer Action Day and discusses workers' comp reform, whether the state should raise the minimum wage, and if a bipartisan consensus can be reached on economic development. This runs about 35 minutes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I always look forward to coming over here. Uh, as far as the process is concerned, uh, there's been a number of uh, uh, meetings with uh, uh, representatives of all four caucuses in the governor's office that goes back uh, last summer. And uh, I've asked uh, three or four of my members who are familiar with the budget uh, to go to those meetings. And there's been an exchange of proposals, uh, some related to the budget, others related to the governor's proposed uh, turnaround agenda. And so those um, meetings have accelerated, I would say. And as far as the legislators meeting, the top legislators meeting, uh, we are going to meet with the governor today at 2.30. So you have a little, little news there for you. Uh, just to, um, and, and we're going to talk about the budget, so that's, uh, that's encouraging. Just to uh, refresh your memory uh, in a neutral way as best I can, even though I'm not that neutral, uh, we, um, the governor proposed a budget last year that was not balanced. <clears throat> um, we then passed a budget it was also not balanced, and, but we acknowledged it was about $4 billion out of whack. Uh, the appropriations that we authorized were about almost identical to the previous year. We didn't go and spend any more money knowing we were so short of money. And that was about a $4 billion gap. And we said to the governor, we want to focus on the budget. We want to sit down with you and either, you know, talk about cuts or revenue or a combination thereof. Um, he said, as you know, he had another... Uh, non-budget related, directly budget related agenda that he wanted us to pass first, and that's where the impasse was. But in the, the problem is that 90% of the budget has been uh, spent. He signed the P-12 increase in spending for education. That part of the budget he signed. Uh, there's court orders uh, for a good part of the budget. There's what we call continuing appropriations for things like debt service that's going out the door. In fact, everything except for higher ed and some human services um, were being spent. And because we had this gap, we're ringing up huge deficits. So we had gone from the big recession in 2009, where we had deficits that got to about $9.3 billion. We paid that down. Uh, up until the day the income tax went down, uh, we got down to about uh, 3.8 billion, which is really about a 30-day payment cycle. Now, because of this budget impasse, we're spending a lot more than we take in, and we should, if we don't do anything about it by July 1st, which is pretty soon, we're gonna have debt of $10 billion, more, more than we even were after the recession. So we've been focusing on, on the budget, the governor's been focusing on these other items, um, so we're, Looking forward today to start talking about a solution to the budget problem. Very good. Well, just a little bit of follow-up. We've heard some legislators, admittedly, um, kind of low rumblings, say that now is the time to really force <clears throat> um, the, the kind of pain that would politically get us over the hump by, in particular, uh, not uh, passing um, elementary and secondary education budget to kind of force a political pressure. Um, is that something that you would consider, or do you think your caucus is uh, thinking some members would think along those well, lines. Well, I, I don't think I would put it that way to try to force, uh, uh, you know, or threaten to f shut down the schools. That's not what I want to do. I do want to focus on the school funding formula. So we have, by anybody's description, uh, the worst, most unfair school funding formula in the nation. There's a bipartisan group called Advance Illinois. You might know about it. They're, they're the ones that have educated us on this. I, I was not aware it was as bad as it is. So we have the most unfair funding formula. If you, if you consider trying to get money to the areas where they need it the most, and we have, if not last, one of the last in state contributions to education. And as a result, our property taxes are about the ninth highest in the nation rather than be more, you know, not, not so onerous. So two-thirds of the money 
for your property taxes goes to education because the state is not contributing as much as most other states. So, um, and keep in mind, there are, in other states, there's been lawsuits filed where the legislature didn't change the formula, there were lawsuits filed. And it happened in Kansas to Sam Brownback over his objections, and the courts ordered a new change in the formula. I believe it happened in California and in Washington State. So we should do this uh, in the legislature. And we've been working on this in the Senate for the last couple of years. The senator who represents this district, Senator Menard, has been uh, working on it uh, diligently. And we're working on it again. So uh, I am, I've talked to the governor about this repeatedly. And I've said to the governor, we really need to change this formula. He has said, well, let's um, study it for a couple of years. <clears throat> and uh, here's the problem. Uh, uh, Senator Menard has proposed a change in the formula where it's uh, alleged that there'll be some winners and losers. The richer school districts will lose some money, the poorer school districts will get it. But you have to understand that under the current formula, there's winners and losers every year. So if we keep the formula the way it is now, and we do what the governor wants to do, and that is to raise the appropriation by $55 million this year, numbers came out today that show that there's a number of school districts that will actually lose money, even though we're spending an extra $55 million. I live in Chicago. Last year we increased, you know, that one part of the budget that the governor signed, the one for P through P pre preschool through high school. We raised spending last year for education, the governor's request, by $265 million. How much of that $265 million do you think went to Chicago? If you're from downstate, you think all of it went to Chicago. <laughs> if you're from Chicago, you don't you think we didn't get enough. But under the formula, some people say Chicago has a special deal. Under the formula last year, out of that $265 million extra dollars, Chicago lost $66 million. And that's because of the formula. You'll say, well, that's the way the formula works. Well, I want to change the formula. It's not fair. This year, according to the statistics that came out today, Chicago will lose 74.4 million. So it's not a matter of, of uh, me threatening to hold up funding for schools uh, unless we get a formula change. I'm just saying I don't see how we can pass a bill that has all these losers, okay? So let's come to the proposed solution. The proposed solution is a bill that Senator Menard's been working on that um, does send more money to the areas where there's a high concentration of poverty. But he agrees with the governor, where the governor says there should be no losers in a funding formula change. So we would have what's called a hold harmless. It would cost more money, but the governor's been open to spending money on education. And so that's what we're pushing for. One other thing to uh, keep in mind when we talk about funding schools and the formulas, for some reason, we're one of the few states in the nation where the state pays the employer contribution for teachers' pensions. So most states, overwhelming number of states, the local school districts pay the employer contribution for teachers' pensions. If you hire a gym teacher for $150,000, you pay the 6% payment, whatever it is, for pensions, the school district pays it. But in Illinois, the state pays it. It's over $3 billion a year that we pay for, into the teacher's retirement system for their pensions. Therefore, the higher the salaries, the uh, more the state pays. But the anomaly in the law is that we don't pay for Chicago. The state doesn't pay, I, I think it's about $10 million or something like that, and $3 billion for, for the rest of the state. We pay a minimal amount. So, that ought to change too. And that's really just parity. 
So I was proposed, and the bill would include, the fact that uh, not a special deal for Chicago, but rather an equal deal for Chicago, that they would have the state pay for uh, the, the employer portion of the pensions. Now, a long-term reform might be to shift that, that obligation from the state back to the local school districts. I'm in favor of that, too. But we should do that after we have pension parity for Chicago in the first place. Wonderful. So you're convinced, though, that uh, Senator Menard's proposal, um, maybe what we all remember, Jim Edgar famously came and wanted to change the formula and didn't get it through. The, the, the most simple um, dynamic uh, politically was that suburbs always think they lose, and while downstate can get some help in Chicago. So you think that that is a political um, hurdle that can be overcome if it's done in a comprehensive way? If, if you do it uh, fairly, and, and Senator Menard's worked on this bill for a couple of years, and he's listened to suburban school superintendents, and some of which have acknowledged that they're, they would be in favor of, of some of these changes. If you do a hold harmless, that means the first year there's no loss. And you phase it out over four years or five years. Remember, this formula change is not actually an appropriation bill. So if you, we choose in the future to pay more money into the schools, uh, then there might not be any losers, okay? It just depends on the appropriation process. But the most important thing is to change the fairness of the formula going forward. Otherwise, there could be a lawsuit and we'll have some court telling us what our formula should be. Well, the courts are spending 90% of our money now, so uh, yeah, I well, don't think... Uh, appropriating 90% of our money now, right. Um, well, very good. Well, thank you. I know that education is uh, a very important issue to you and your caucus and across the legislature and, and people in this room. Um, difficult issue, but one that uh, I think we'd all like to see some um, improvement on. I'd like to go ahead and move to uh, also another issue we talked about last year and in the past. And uh, uh, in the past, you have been very helpful in getting some workers' compensation changes. Uh, we have uh, the 2011 amendments uh, that uh, did help a number of businesses. Uh, our position here at the chamber is that we still have a big gap between where Illinois is and our competing states, uh, and that there are more changes that are needed. Uh, so with that in mind, I just wondered if you wanted to, however you want to approach it, if there are ideas that you have, or if you would like to handicap on whether workers' comp is something that can be done as part of a grand bargain uh, with the governor and, and other Republicans. Okay, well, first of all, uh, you know, this is obviously not an area that I uh, was that familiar with until about four years ago when we passed these reforms. And there's a lot of um, uh, difficulty in understanding what the true facts are. So I have a bunch of statistics here which would argue that this, we've made a lot of improvements and we're not quite as bad as you may have read in the some newsletters. Your newsletter or the Illinois Policy Institute or the Tribune Editorial Board, um, I, I don't know. It depends. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it is kind of difficult these days to start from. It would be nice if we could all start from the same facts. But the, the, the bill that we passed, first of all, workers' comp costs are, I think people would under, agree, you know, they're half of what they were 20 years ago. And they're, as a result of the bill that we passed four years ago, the recommendation for rates has come down by 19%. Um, nobody likes to pay taxes. If you're self-insured, we have no idea what you're paying because there's no way for, you're not subject to FOIA and we have no idea if you're paying a lot more or less. And the, you know, some people have proposed that you should have to disclose how much you're paying so that we can have an idea. Um, we do know that this was one of the biggest drops of any state in the nation. Um, and keep in mind that it was a very difficult bill to pass. So I don't know if Leader Durkin's going to come and address you, but for example, the last bill that we passed four years ago, he voted against it. So when you pass workers' comp reform, you take on doctors, hospitals, trial lawyers, and unions. And for your reward, you get to please the Chamber of Commerce. So, but politically, think about that. And I think there was only one Republican in the House that voted for the reform last time. Uh, and it was a bipartisan effort in the Senate. And there's actually been legislation that we put together acknowledging we could do better that's actually passed the Senate. Uh, the House, last year, the House passed a different version. There's some really good stuff in there. 
but it wasn't up to the governor's level of request, so therefore we didn't finish the job, but we certainly have legislation out there that we think would be very helpful. Um, you know, people got to remember that the uh, workers' comp, you know, if you really want to make a point, you put a bill in to abolish workers' comp. And then, then you guys would be against that because then everybody's suing in court. It is a system that keeps uh, the employees from, from suing in many cases, right? And so we're all working to uh, try to cut out fraud. We're trying to uh, bring the premiums down as best we can. But a lot of it can be done even before you reduce people's benefits. The efficiency of the Workers' Comp Commission is, is terrible because of, of uh, outdated uh, computers and the like. So we, we can definitely do that. And there's, that's in the bill we passed. Um, there's, um, let me see if there's other, uh, oh, one other problem. I don't know how you folks here feel about salaries, being owners, maybe salaries, you know, are a cost for you. But in Illinois, I personally think this is a good thing. Our wages are much higher than the states that surround us, by a lot. <clears throat> We're 21.4% higher than Indiana, for example. So we, our average wages in Illinois, 54,105, that's the, that's the Illinois wages. Uh, I think it's from the Bureau of Labor, Labor um, uh, Bureau, what is it, the Federal Bureau of La Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Census of Employment and Wages. So we're a lot higher. So when you get, you know, 20, 22% more in wages, part of your workers, part of your workers' costs are, uh, when people are out of work, you gotta pay a percentage of their wages and therefore you have to pay more. So. Uh, our injury rate is much lower than the national average. Our medical costs are much lower because as part of the bill, we, we limited the amount of money that we pay in a medical fee schedule, limited the amount of money we pay for hospitals. Uh, so again, we've said from the start, we're open to further negotiations, but to totally undermine the, the bargain that we have with workers' comp, it, which is what we thought the governor's proposal was, was not fair. Okay. Very good. Let me go ahead and move to something, because we'll uh, probably, I'll ask one more question here. I'm going to jump down to transportation, then we can uh, save a little more time for some uh, questions from the audience. But uh, obviously, um, that we surprisingly, um, there was a positive uh, action on transportation investment out of Washington. Uh, also, uh, the department, uh, IDOT announced a higher uh, spend on um, transportation investment uh, this year, which we're not quite sure where the money comes from. But uh, still, we believe that in, uh, investment in the state's vital transportation infrastructure is just absolutely in, important going forward. And if we've moved uh, the crisis out of 2016 and into 2017, it's still there. So I would tell you that from our standpoint, the Chamber, we believe very strongly that um, to have adequate investment in transportation, it needs to be part of a deal on the budget if there's going to be an overall comprehensive discussion about revenues and such. So can you tell me if there's been a, a lot of discussion about it, or what is your view on the ability to get a um, transportation investment bill done? Okay, so a little history. I got elected the same day as Senator Rodonio uh, back in 2009. And my number one priority back then was to, on the day that I got inaugurated, was to pass a capital bill. The reason why we did not have a capital bill for 10 years was because of the distrust of uh, the previous governor, uh, Blagojevich. You cannot vote as a Republican for appropriations to the executive branch and not know and trust that that governor is going to spend the money in a fair way and not a political way. And that's one of the reasons why we hadn't, didn't have a bill. Um, even though we got off to a, a, there was a little diversion that first day I got sworn in because we started an impeachment trial. Um, after we got that out of the way, we started working on a capital bill. And within 10 weeks, we had passed a bill that hadn't happened in 10 years. And it was totally bipartisan. Senator Rodonio and I worked together, and uh, there's two parts to it. There's deciding where to spend the money in a big state, <clears throat> a lot of diversity, uh, upstate, downstate, mass transit, um, a number of other, uh, wasn't just roads and infrastructure, it was hospitals and schools. We had to decide that, and we had to figure out how to pay for it. 
And at the time, we were, gas was about what it is now, about $1.80. And we were open to talking about a nickel uh, gas tax, and not everybody was on board, so we didn't do it. And instead, we came up with a bunch of different fees and, and taxes, and we had a bipartisan support for that. And it passed, and it triggered, uh, I think it was almost, with matching dollars, almost $30 billion. But obviously, that was a, a, some time ago. And it's time to do it again. There's, it's easier to do it because it's politically a little bit more, uh, you have a little bit more of a bipartisan lobbying effort. You have road builders who are for a tax increase because there's, there's more work for them and there's unions that build the roads that are for it. And so um, I am 100% in favor of doing a capital bill, but clearly you can't do it until you have a budget. You can do them at the same time. Um, I'm pretty sure you're, you would agree, like everybody who knows anything about the state budget, you'd agree that it would almost be impossible to have a balanced budget without some revenue. And so uh, if we're going to talk about revenue for the budget, we might as well talk about revenue for the capital bill as well. And just as an aside, um, I personally am sponsoring a bill dealing with how to pay for the roads. And it's a major change. No state's ever done it. It uh, takes a while to educate people on it, but it would replace our gas tax with a user fee. So everybody would pay by the mile. And it would start out to be an approximation of about the same money we bring in now from the gas tax, but it would stop the decline in the revenues that come into our road fund. So as Cars get better gas mileage, there's fewer gallons that you need to drive, and if you have an electric car, like I do, I'm not paying anything for the roads. And so we have to do something to change that. And so that's uh, uh, something that, however, it's complicated, it takes, it takes a while to um, explain it, but there is a bill out there, no state has done it, uh, it would take a couple years to implement, but I think it's something which is the future. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any I'm other not, questions. I'd be silent. I'm going to sneak in one more question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned Senator Menard. He's been busy since he's been in the Senate. Uh, he also uh, started out uh, his career working on economic development, and particularly how we organize economic development uh, here. I think, especially in the chamber community, there's, I think, been, and perhaps maybe across the board, a great dissatisfaction with uh, how DCO had um, been running things. So we are personally, uh, at the Illinois Chamber, very excited about the idea of the corporation. Uh, which was actually embraced by Senator Menard in a different, you know, at least conceptually, uh, and wondered if there is, what's the opportunity over the short term for bipartisan agreement on what economic development should look like. Um, we've had the discussion, at least started before, isn't now the year that we could really get bipartisan consensus on economic development? Yes, actually, Senator Menard used to be my chief of staff and then he ran for the legislature, and I actually uh, introduced legislation myself. Uh, might have been even before I was president, because I saw that other states had done this. So we have a, you know, DECIO, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, uh, you know, uh, people appointed by the governor to make these decisions about how to incentivize business to stay or come into the state. Why not have business people give advice to do that? And that's exactly what we did. We copied legislation. I think Indiana had it, Michigan, Iowa. and. Uh, Unfortunately, Governor Quinn didn't support it. And so, Menar put the bill in after I did, and it didn't pass. So now we have the Governor uh, Rauner, who created the Illinois Business and Economic Development Corporation. Um, you know, they're by executive order, I believe, we're, we're, we're supportive. Um, and the, uh, it's a private not-for-profit. Um, in committing taxpayers to a particular deal, though, it, it, it has to be a hybrid. You have to have some tie to the people who, you know, vote for, the, vote for the, the money and vote for the taxes to pay for it. But I think it makes all the sense in the world. And I think that, uh, again, everything hinges on a budget. And once we get that to that budget, um, uh, I, I think that it'll, uh, it'll help. We, we, have, we, we do not benefit by tearing down or bad-mouthing the state. I mean, I've said this before. I was very frustrated during the last campaign for governor. Uh, we even started our own website 
uh, the Illinois Senate Democrats called ILikeIllinois.com because there was so much negative stories, which were a lot of which was inaccurate, that we just put accurate and positive stories about the state. I mean, we have a great educated workforce. We make more money than all the states around us, as I pointed out earlier. We have a great transportation system. And, uh, you know, we have these strengths that we should be bragging about. And I think uh, the image we have is what the problem is, the reputation. And it's because the only state in the nation doesn't have a budget passed. And once we do that, I think there's, uh, uh, it's going to be a big help. Very good. All right, now uh, we will turn it over. I think we probably got time for two, maybe three questions. Uh, then the uh, president, who's been very generous with his time, needs to get across the street to another event. We need to get on with our agenda. But if we've got two or three questions. Realistically, will anything happen before the election? Well, I think it has to. So we're running out of, you know, the, the schools are run, the, the universities have been living on tuition. They, they get money from tuition and from us. We haven't given them any money. High school counselors are telling kids to not go to college in Illinois. It's ridiculous. So I, I don't think that we can go any further. But we've been sort of saying this from the start. And we've also said to the governor's proposals on his turnaround agenda, we would be open to discussing some of those issues, like workers' comp. And we've made proposals that chart significant. They haven't measured up to his standards yet, and that's where the rub is spent. But I, I, I believe we even know for these working groups what the nature of a budget would look like. And so I, I think it can definitely happen. Um, my question is, you, you had mentioned that Illinois has got one of the highest wage rates in the area surrounding us, and yes. people are making more money in Illinois. So why are we looking at legislation to raise the minimum wage in Illinois, if we're already doing very well in that and companies are paying what they can afford? Yeah. You know, um, as you know, in other states, there's efforts to move the minimum wage up to $15. What, what I did uh, two years ago, uh, we, we put the issue on the ballot. Not surprisingly, two-thirds of Illinois said, yeah, we raise the minimum wage. Uh, the city of Chicago, uh, perhaps under pressure because of an election, went ahead and raised the minimum wage with an escalator. And so I work with the Restaurant Association and... Um, uh, the Retail Merchants Association, to try to reach some kind of a compromise where uh, we did, didn't have the problem of Chicago minimum wage going up dramatically and right across the street have it be much lower. And so we passed a bill that would be, I felt like a compromise, it would increase the minimum wage over five years, I think, and it was something like 50 cents a year. Um, and we got the neutrality of the Restaurant Association because we capped the amount of money that Chicago could, could increase theirs. So, I mean, I don't think, um, I mean, $15 an hour puts people out of work. Uh, maybe eventually over five years to go from eight and a quarter, which has been there for quite some time, up uh, to a, a negotiated higher level would be appropriate and with some Benefits to business in that we would say other cities cannot raise it unilaterally. Chicago should be capped. And uh, I think the governor has even indicated that he's in favor of some increase. So that's just something that has to be uh, negotiated. But I do recognize the fact that there, are, there comes a tipping point where you literally have to lay people off and you're not creating jobs, you're doing the opposite. Yes, you had... Oh, my, my issue is that, with that is that gas prices are down, so you need more tax money. So when you go ahead and then, you know, implement this new system, when the gas prices go up, is that going to then be rethought about and recalibrated? Um, it, what we would set up is a, a kind of like a, a toll highway authority, you know, where, where they, they're on the tollway. You would have an a entity like that that would run this uh, user fee program. There would be not the government, but a private entity that would monitor this. So, and the privacy would be paramount uh, in, in terms of people's cars. Yeah, it kind of seems more. like Big Brother, you know. I'm sorry? Uh, you know, it just seems a little controlling, like a little government controlling things. 
Yeah, well, we're not trying to control anything. We're just trying to collect enough money to pay for the roads. And the, um, right now, we, with the gas tax that we have, which hasn't been raised for, I don't know, 20 years, um, it's just really difficult to raise the gas tax politically. And the problem is that even as you do that, is car, you know, the CAFE standards set by the federal government are going to go up to like 50 miles per gallon. And as a result, you're buying less gas, and there's just not as much enough money to pay for the roads. So and the distribution, by the way, of the money would remain exactly the same. So the money goes into the road fund. A lot of people are concerned this is, once again, stealing money for, for Chicago. You know, we're not doing that. The people that have gas guzzlers now pay more for the roads now because they buy more gas. So uh, it, it, it just takes a long time to educate folks about it. But uh, it's, I'm going to put it this way. This is inevitable. If it doesn't happen in two years, it's eventually going to have to happen. That's all. Yeah, my other thing is I'm from uh, District 204 in Naperville, and they just announced today that there's a million dollars less that's going to be going to that district, and it's being redirected to other towns and Elgin and all that. An average under, under the governor's proposal? No, it's something that passed. I just should have read it about it in the paper today. So yeah. in Naperville, you're paying for a $450,000 house uh, on average 12,000 in taxes, right? I don't know what they're paying in Elgin or these places where this money is being redirected, but you know, I'm kind of, well, people moved to Naperville to get those good schools and this, that, and the other thing. And now, once again, our taxes are gonna go up yet again in order for the schools to then have the same programs that they need to have. So that's that whole problem with the redistribution that I see. Right, yeah. well, you've, you've uh accurately described the, yeah. the, the issue. And so we have just great disparity in the quality of schools because uh, we spend a whole bunch of money per pupil in some districts and really low in another. And so the purpose of the formula theori theoretically is designed to kind of narrow those differences. And so it's just a matter of degree. And remember, the change in the formula doesn't necessarily mean that people would lose any money. And the proposal that Senator Menard has, you would lose nothing in Naperville. It's a hold harmless. Even after changing the formula, the bill says you cannot get less than you did the year before. And we would commit to funding the difference. That's what a hold harmless is. Okay, one last one. Um, I think I read in a recent newsletter that the road fund, which you're saying we need more money in, um, doesn't some of that money get pulled out of there into the general fund? So oh, yeah, would dumping more money in there sure. really help the situation? Yeah, this is a, um, uh, one of the benefits of uh, being here a long time is that you have some institutional memory. So from my first day in the General Assembly till today, there's always a fight about road fund diversions. Okay, so money goes into the road fund, a majority of the money in the road fund goes, obviously, to the downstate areas, 55%, because there's more road, longer roads, right? And there's always been a fight about whether you can take any money out of there for other purposes that are indirectly related to the roads. And so when we passed that capital bill uh, in 2009, we ended some, but not all, of the road fund diversions. That was another incentive for the downstaters to vote for the bill. So uh, I don't have the specifics as to what remaining diversions exist, but it's been a, an age-old uh, dispute. And again, it's part of the negotiations in the capital bill to see if we can have some further, uh, if there's enough money in the, in the general fund, you can eliminate some diversions and, and leave some more money in the road fund as a result. I, the, I have a yes or no question, Todd. Oh, no, or did, yes or no, yes or no. Did you put $1,000 down on the new Tesla or not? Yes, I did. So um, my wife, um, I don't know about if anybody here is married, but about five years ago, my wife asked me what I was going to get her for Mother's Day. And uh, I hadn't thought about it because it was a week or so before. So she said, here's what you can get me. And it was a brand new car. I didn't think we needed a new car, but um, so I said to her, how much does it cost? And she said, I'm not certain. And I said, well, let's go look at it. She says, well, we can't. I said, well, why not? She says, they haven't built it yet. And I said, well, then what's 
when they built it, we'll go look at it and we'll talk about buying it. She said, no, there's a deposit. You have to put a deposit down. And I said, well, I don't want to be a lawyer on you here, but if we put the deposit down and they don't build the car, do we get our money back? She said, I don't know. <laughs> so I did a little calculation and I figured, well, if I spend the $5,000 and they don't build the car, I can, you know, I never win any arguments in my house. I figured I could remind her about the $5,000 that we wasted for a long time. So I put the deposit down and then sure enough, a year later they said, your car's being built. And uh, so she wanted to do it because it doesn't have any emissions. And it turned out to be really a lot more expensive than I thought, but it's, uh, it's a great deal. So um, the other day they said they're going to sell one for $35,000. So I put $1,000 down. So hopefully next year when it comes in, I'll uh, continue to ruin the roads and not pay for anything. Well, again, thank you very, very much, Mr. President, and uh, appreciate coming out.